quick introductions. My name is Sean. I'm also known as Genovi. I have a show called Retro Impressions on YouTube. I create gaming documentaries and do reviews for games up through the late 90s. Rob, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Rob. I'm the moderator of our Retro Gaming. We're one of the largest retro gaming communities online. And so what we like to do is get guests like you who have been really influential in all of our lives and, you know, our lives growing up awesome in video gaming. And then to my right is uh, Zach. So Zach's going to be having to share my microphone. Hello there. Nice to meet you, Mr. Hawkins. I love it. Old school. All anyway, right. It's so a pleasure to be here. Let's, let's go ahead and get started then. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it to Sean to get going. Part of the goal of the conversation that we're hoping to have with you over the next hour is to touch on a bunch of stuff that, that we don't feel is, if it has been discussed before, it's either been lost or very hard to find or has never really been touched on to any degree of detail. And I'm going to start just kind of with the icebreaker, hopefully something that you might find a little bit funny. I've had a lot of conversations with folks, and they find it kind of interesting that you were mentioned in People Magazine's 1994 list of the 50 most beautiful people. And we kind of wanted to know, we wanted to know how you felt about that then and how you feel about that now. Well, uh, it was, uh, it seemed, it seemed kind of weird at the time. And at the same time, it's, uh, I don't know, just about any form of recognition is uh, probably, you know, probably feels good. It, it, uh, it admittedly that, that, that's a, a reasonably silly thing, but what the heck, you know, it's, it's nice, it's nice to have that kind of publication occasionally, uh, put a nerd in there and, you know, I'm happy to represent, uh, all the world's nerds in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so Tripp, you graduated from uh, Harvard with a degree in applied game theory, which is a program that I understand you helped design. So my question is, is, you know, when you were in college, what gravitated you toward game design? What made you see that as something viable in the future that you wanted to be a part of? What inspired you? Well, so Harvard, uh, they, they, uh, they had 40 departments like, you know, a typical university they didn't even yet have a computer science department. They were teaching computer courses, but they put them in the applied math department. So they, they were, oh, I think about uh, academic innovation. That's one of the things I think you get with a uh, old school, literally and figuratively. But they did have this uh, safety valve where if you didn't like any of those 40 departments and you were trying to do something unique and different, they had a committee that you could apply to and kind of create your own major. And they made it pretty hard to do that. They made, made you jump through a bunch of extra hoops. But I kind of already knew as a, a teenager what I really wanted to do. So when I was a kid, I had discovered the joy of play and the joy of games. And I particularly liked games that allow you to manage resources and make meaningful decisions that were sometimes simulating kind of powerful, more adult stuff. And yeah. of course, I'm talking about uh, early sports games that were like the uh, D&D equivalent, but in a sports simulation. Uh, and of course, things like D&D that came along. And I, I just uh, enjoyed that feeling of authenticity and adult-like power decision-making in a situation. And I realized that if you just always had to do that with uh, paper and, and dice and charts, it was going to be pretty hard to operate. And I saw a lot of the people that I tried to engage in this kind of gaming, they were lazy and they'd rather just watch television. <laughs> so as soon as, as soon as I heard about computers and, you know, again, I was a, uh, you know, a teenager when I started hearing about computers and I realized, Oh, okay, well that's what I can do is I can basically put the uh, game inside the box and, have real life in a box and start putting pretty pictures on a screen that that can look more and more like television over time as compute power gets better and that that became uh, my dream and my passion and you know it took about 30 years for all of that to come about but pretty much everything i was doing in my career was planned way way far in advance yeah because pretty much we were at that point today where things are cinematic in gaming nowadays yeah. it's almost like an interactive movie or in some ways like a better medium so did you also see that as being a great storytelling medium back then as well yeah absolutely and i think it's really cool that today sometimes you'll get a glance of a screen 
and you won't really be sure is that a football game that they're broadcasting or is that a screen from an ad for Madden or you know, is, is this a gameplay session? I mean, I think it's fantastic that the graphics are so good that sometimes you can't tell which is which. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, even like now you start to see uh, FMV coming back a little bit. And at first I'll be thrown and think it's, man, these, this cutscene looks really good. <laughs> and then it's mm -hmm. real. Um, so going back then, you know, what computers was it that you started out on? And what, what do you first remember the first time you saw video games? What are your first memories of video video games? Well, the first computer I got my hands on, it was a PDP-8 kit that a friend of my dad's had built. And this guy was... Uh, actually a real pioneer in the coin-operated uh, game market. And he, uh, he hadn't done that yet, just as a hobby. He went and got this kit, he built it, he attached it to a, a pretty old um, teletype terminal that had a roll of yellow paper coming out of it. So all you were interacting with was a keyboard where you could type in you know, letters and numbers, and then it had this, uh, you know, you'd hit return, and it would, it would then maybe spit out a few lines of uh, characters, and he'd made a a simple matching game. You might remember the uh, board game called Mastermind, where you're trying to remember a sequence of four pegs and what trying to figure out what colors they are. Yeah. And, and he did the same thing with uh, numbers, and that that was uh, really inspiring for me. I, th I think I saw that in 1971. So this is before there were microprocessors, before yeah. there was a yeah. personal computer, before there was a video game of, of any kind. Yeah, before and Ralph Bear. Yeah, so it, it just kind of set the set the bit for me about okay, I get it. Uh, this is going to get better over time. It's going to gradually turn into a legitimate medium of communications and be right up there with television. I I just uh, had that clear vision about it. Yeah, and then in a lot of ways, you know, beyond that, with the online community and that you have more community around gaming in a lot of ways than you don't have around movies or television when you're watching them. Like in games, it's interactive. Uh, exchange of ideas and experience. That, that's the key. I, and I felt that as a kid. I realized that, hey, there's interaction here. Yeah. And it's making me think. And there's a feedback loop. And I'm adjusting based on, on what's what's happening. And I could just tell that it was activating my brain. And I, I sort of, you know, it, uh, had the intuition that it was the most intense uh, learning environment. I, I kind of realized from doing that that we really do learn by doing, and that's something that always, that always learn by doing. since then have, you know, that you know when you're interacting, you are uh, growing uh, neurotransmitter connections and new brain cells faster than anything else. So video games, they're really, in fact, uh, food for your brain. And of course, I don't, I don't really care for a subject matter that's maybe offensive or inappropriate. Uh, or that doesn't in terms of what you might be learning. Uh, I'd, I'd much rather play a game where maybe the topic is relevant, the story is relevant. There's uh, you know additional emotional depth around characters, sure. but just the interaction itself is way better for you than sitting there passively being a uh, you know uh, a couch potato, you know watching uh, watching video. Yeah, and you know, in my this is my industry now. Like, I mean, I, I work in learning and development, and so much of what the content I see development in my industry is still a person shooting a video and talking over it, and not interacting and walking through the process, which drives me crazy. I can pull my hair out, but we're limited on time. So, Trip, uh, after after college, you started at Apple. So, what made that an attractive company to you? And tell us a little bit about. You know what you did there? Do you have any cool jobs or was stories to share with us? Yeah, so I, I basically figured out, again, while I was still in school, I figured out that I moved forward and, you know, gradually you'd be able to do things in your home. And it was actually in 1975, while I was still a college student, that I actually made the decision that I would start Electronic Arts in 1982. I'd been thinking about it. Yeah. And planning, but I actually pegged the date seven years before I founded the company. And one of the things I wanted to do before I started was finish school and work somewhere else where I would help sell computers into homes so that there would be a market for the games I wanted to make. And I already had a, an interest in uh, sports simulation as kind of a primary uh, personal theme, but I, uh, I, w I wanted to you know, help enable other kinds of games also. 
Yeah. So I, I uh, had that kind of figured out uh, while I was still in school in the 70s. And, and then uh, I, I realized that I needed to know more about uh, hardware. I mean, I, I learned a lot about software and programming and game design while I was in college doing my special major. And I had summer, summer jobs sometimes where I was doing software programming also. But uh, I thought, well, I've got to go help a hardware company get more hardware systems in homes. And I ended up doing a summer project for a market research company where they let me do the national study published by a professional market research firm about personal computers and home computers. And that kind of got, got me the opportunity to then get to know a bunch of these companies. And, and I uh, got offers from more than one of them. And I figured out that Apple had to be. I, thought I wanted to go help them build a business. They actually were a more interesting home computer company at that time. And pretty quickly, we figured out there were better ways to grow the business. And it was still a fantastic experience for me. I, I was at Apple for four years. And when I joined the company, we had about 25 office workers and another 25 people on a manufacturing line in the back where they were making a couple hundred hobby machines a month. That's that's how tiny the company was. And four years later, we had 4,000 employees and we're a you know, public company doing a billion dollars in revenue. So it was an incredible growth experience for me, uh, you know, collaborating with the founders the whole time I was there and you know, helping pioneer that industry. And I had a lot to do with uh, our success in uh, attacking the uh, office desktop market. That became the big market segment. And that was kind of my baby. That's the most lasting. One of the most lasting things from that era of Apple is their home computer business. Well, you know, it's funny because it, it came back around. I mean, App Apple really is a consumer company now. And they kind of started that way. And then, you know, for a long time, they were really competing, you know, more as a uh, office desktop product company. And yeah. now it's back to uh, those original roots. And, you know, in terms of how that all started, uh, close with Steve Jobs. And I, uh, I actually arranged for the first mouse to be brought in the company. I personally brought the first spreadsheet software into the company. I did the first uh, field training it, uh, in the retail channel for any of these uh, office tools. Uh, made the first uh, business software of different kinds, so it was uh, it was a lot of fun. And then I uh, I kind of led a team that that specified the next generation equipment that we would need and how you would uh, need to work with it. And that included uh, introducing topics to the industry like the idea of icons. You know, nobody really done that before. You know, Desktop little icons. Icons for a graphical user interface. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we kind of take all that stuff for granted now, but yeah. you know, we, we were kind of specifying the first use of Windows and, and uh, bitmap graphics and all that stuff. Now, you said you wanted to, you, you, had, you already had a plan for EA from college. So, what, so you're at Apple. How did you make EA happen? How, how did you bring your plan to life? Well, I, I had learned from you know, business courses that I'd taken that. You know, if you're going to start a company, it's going to be really hard to make it work, and, you, and you'd better have a big idea. And I and I really, pretty much agree with that. And while I knew I wanted to start the company, but I wasn't really sure what my big idea was. And around 1980, some of the first uh, games were coming out. Of course, you know, Atari had been uh, doing some console stuff, and we started to have uh, decent games. That would uh, you know run on a home computer you know that were uh, sold on floppy disks, and I actually uh, helped a fledgling company that a, a young man had started in his bedroom in Palo Alto just with uh, some funding from his uncle. Uh, the uh, uh, the the house he was living in was owned by his uncle, and that came that company became uh, Strategic Simulations, which was a you know early kind of war game company that. That made games on the Apple II that were, uh, uh, you know, kind of like Avalon Hill War games. In fact, his first product was called Bismarck. It was kind of a direct copy of the Avalon Hill game. Anyway, uh, that was in 1980, and I found out about that from a venture guy who wanted me to go run it, leave Apple, and I wanted to start my own company. So I ended up just joining their board of directors and kind of helping them. 
And it was uh, during that period from 1980 to 1982 where I, I knew the time is coming and I'm gonna and I'm gonna need to leave Apple and go do this. But what's the big idea? I got to just hanging around Apple, working with extremely creative, talented engineers, software engineers. That's when I began to realize that, that wow, you know, these guys are artists. These guys are incredibly innovative, creative people, and they're living a lifestyle and operating pretty much like Renaissance artists did 500 years ago and Hollywood people started doing 100 years ago and, and just realizing that, yeah, this is how this process works and nobody is really thinking about computer software as an art form and the people that make it like artists. And that's a big idea. So and that's then where I started, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, that's where your vision of developers as artists comes from, from this experience. Yeah. And and uh, and then it you know, honestly it became really easy after that for me to think, okay, well, uh, how does Hollywood do this kind of thing, and which business practices do they have that would make sense for me to use? And I, and I and I learned a lot of things at Apple that I baked into the initial strategy for Electronic Arts, but then I uh, I just studied Hollywood really uh, actively and read a lot of books and went down to Hollywood and met people and looked at what tracks look like with talent and learned more about how they organize and manage talent and, and publishing functions and distribution, marketing, promotion, all of that, and kind of integrated all of these things into a, a new kind of model for a new industry. And the game publishing industry at that time, I would call it uh, a cottage industry. There was a, a bunch of little guys. Sure. Uh, often the games were sold in baggies, or they they really weren't very good. You know, even the best Atari games were extremely primitive because that machine, the Atari uh, computer system, VCS, also known as the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Uh, you you might not believe this, but it it only had one hundred and twenty eight. Uh, uh, basically, bytes of RAM. And I, you'll notice I did not say kilobyte, right? Megabyte. Literally 128. It's like you could practically count them on your fingers and toes. So there just wasn't much you, much you could do with it. It was kind of a glorified uh, hula hoop. And the uh, obviously the uh, er, first computers like the Apple II all had weaknesses. Like the Apple II, you couldn't hook up a second joystick. It didn't have a sound chip. It did other pioneering things like having color and bitmap graphics. But it took a while to get to machines where you can stuff I wanted. So during that early years of EA, what was your favorite platforms to work with? Well, uh, I, I became, uh, first of all, I, I would say in the very early early period, I liked the Atari 800 because it was a lot like an Apple II, but you could actually hook up four joysticks to it, which was awesome. Yeah. So if you look at a classic game like Mule, that was the machine you wanted to play on because you could have four players and that was an awesome, four-player game. And, you know, games like that were really the beginning of multiplayer gaming. They were really the beginning of social gaming and in some respects, the beginning of casual games. So that was, that was pretty cool. And of course, uh, that, that product, the Atari 800 didn't make it within a couple of years. I got very excited about the Commodore Amiga and I even tried yeah. to get Apple to acquire that company. And, and it was uh, kind of sad how little Commodore was able to do with that after they acquired the, the Amiga company. But that machine, it had a real 16-bit processor, the Motorola MC6. And, and uh, they also uh, had a sound chip and a, a graphics chip. And it was a legitimately potent 16-bit machine at a time when the PC industry hadn't yet figured out that they needed to do more than just run a spreadsheet and a word processor. So a lot with the Amiga, which is, of course, what then set up uh, a great opportunity for us once the Sega Genesis showed up. Yeah, that, that's, that's actually what our next question is concerned with. I actually was curious, how did you guys decide what games to port over from the Amiga or from the European market? How did you guys decide what was suitable for the American audience? Are you talking about what uh, when a game had already appeared uh, on an 8-bit machine like the Commodore 64 or, or had or already appeared on the like Commodore Amiga. Amiga? And you're, talking and you're where, bringing it over to Genesis. Yeah. 
Well, uh, you know, frankly, I did I did something pretty radical with the Sega Genesis when, <laughs> when I heard about it. So the, the Genesis launched first in Japan in 1988 yep. as the you know, Sega Mega Drive in Japan. And I, I, we got a hold of one, and I was really delighted with that machine because it was uh, basically selling for less than $200. It came with two joysticks. It had a, 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 a pretty good graphics chip. It, it had a you know, pretty good sound chip, and it had a, a Motorola 68000. So it, it had all the right stuff. And I thought, shoot, we've got all kinds of great games on the Amiga that can move over. We have uh, some games on the PC that can move over. And we had uh, uh, other opportunities, like the fact that we had licensed the coin-up game Marvel Madness. And that was built on a coin-up machine that was based on the Motorola MC68000. So we had relationships where we thought, yeah, we, we got all kinds of really fantastic 68000 assembly code and relationships with, with uh, you know, coin-up companies that you know, we, we can ramp up a product line really fast. And I wasn't that happy with the trend that had been started by Nintendo with the very draconian licensing models yeah. where they're keeping a lot of the revenue and they're inhibiting uh, developer freedom and making the cost too high. And I thought, you know, uh, we don't have to enter into a conventional license agreement and say we, we can reverse engineer the machine. And that was probably the most important thing that happened in, in EA's history. And it basically transformed the company in about a two-year period from a company that was worth $60 million to one that was worth $2 billion. It was a pretty dramatic transformation. I have a question regarding that whole situation. I, I, think it's, I think it's pretty well known. It's been documented quite a bit. And I actually talked to Michael Katz about the negotiations at the summer CES. And according to him, when you guys first presented what you were going to do with the technology... They entered into an agreement with you right away at Summer CES. And then later on down the year, they ran into this problem with their Joe Montana football game. And that led to a second set of negotiations, which sweetened the deal for EA even further. And I'm wondering if you could shine a little bit of light on the first set of negotiations and what you guys acquired through those versus the second set of negotiations that happened with Japan. Yeah, well, I want to take you back even a little further to... The, the, the point where this really started cool. was we, we, we get the Japanese machine. And then we know that there's going to be a U.S. version coming to market in a year. So we were able to kind of get started on the reverse engineering process where you need a clean room. You have to have some volunteers that are willing to go into that room with no tools, build their own tools from scratch. They're going to technically violate copyright law by using a symbolic debugger to take the code that's in a game or the code that might be in a chip and display it on the screen because what's displayed on the screen is a copy of copyrighted material. And if you do this correctly in a legitimate clean room, that's considered fair use under copyright law. You're allowed to infringe the copyright if your entire purpose is to understand how that machine works. And then you can write your own book about how that machine works and some other dude that wasn't in the clean room, that didn't violate the copyright legitimately, can then take your, your writing about what they need to do to make a game that works, and they can make a game. But this is a form of heroism because the guys that went to the clean room, they had to literally just march through this desert, and they had to do so knowing that they would not be able to make games for that machine because they had done that copyright infringement they couldn't directly benefit from that knowledge because they got it through copyright infringement. So uh, th those are among my favorite people ever in the history of EA, and, and notably Jim Nichols, because he did the most breakthrough work in figuring out how the Genesis worked. And Steve Hayes is a, another one, uh, also known as Shays. Steve Hayes, he was one of the uh, earliest employees at EA. He's a really great guy uh, in, in a lot of different ways. But again, he was heroic about uh, David Maynard, another one. So these guys were amazing heroes that just literally entered a desert uh, that no human being had ever crossed and made it all the way to the other side. And it took like a year. And then of course we think, oh, but now you got to get the US version when that comes out and make sure that you're still okay. Because when Nintendo 
a switch from the uh, Famicom in Japan to the NES for the U.S. market, that's when they put the security chip in. Right. And the security chip was patented. So you really can't mess with patent infringement. And we were just crossing our fingers, hoping that the Sega Genesis was going to be identical to the Mega Drive in Japan. And thankfully, it was. Yeah. Okay, so we're about a year into this process. We've developed, we've built some development tools. We've supplied a bunch of our developers. I've also gone around to companies where we were distributing games for other companies, you know, small publishers that were funding their own development, that had some of their own brands, that were doing their own product packaging. And we were basically their, their distribution and sales apparatus. And I went to all these guys and I said, hey, uh, we're doing this and we'd love to have you participate. And, it, and we can just give you the knowledge that we have or fund you to develop the games and be your publisher. Or we can just be a distributor by hiring you as a developer. Uh, you know, we, we, we can do this a bunch of different ways. Right. And the, the funny thing about that was that uh, Sega began to hear that we were having some of these conversations. And they were really worried that I might just turn a third-party licensing program because why would anybody get a license from Sega and overpay for it and be agreeing to a bunch of limitations and contract when they could get a much more open, free license from me that would be actually, in fact, a lot cheaper. The irony about this was that what Sega didn't know at that time is that uh, nobody was interested. There was no interest. Everybody was terrified of getting sued by Sega. <laughs> so they just, they just didn't want to do it. And I knew that, but I guess Sega didn't, didn't know that. Anyway, yeah. I'm just, you know, full speed ahead, damn the torpedoes. And we're going to do a bunch of games. But as, as we're getting closer to coming to market, so now, now you're basically in, in May of um, April, early May 1990. CES is coming in early June. And we know Sega is going to be there. We're going to be there. Uh, we're going to be showing products in our booth. And we've planned all this to go forward and do this without a license, a fan. And I just knew uh, uh, that as a conscious, responsible CEO of a public company, I really ought to go talk to Sega before we blindsided them at the show and see if we could be partners with them instead of starting a war. Okay, and so I no, called no. it. Let me, let me stop you right there just for one second. I hate to interrupt, but what? As you were doing all this and preparing to this for this meeting, what is your in your mind's eye? What is your reaction? What is you sorry? What is it you think that Sega's reaction is going to be to all this? Uh, you know, I, I really wasn't sure, and in a way, I didn't really care because I was <laughs> determined to do what we were going to do, no matter what their attitude was. I just thought I would be a more responsible CEO, doing a more complete job if I investigated that scenario. I really didn't have much faith that they would uh, cooperate. Anyway, I called David Rosen. Uh, David was actually the original founder of Sega. Uh, he was over in Japan after World War II and thought, hey, these uh, US military personnel that are on you know, military bases, they need some entertainment. And he started uh, distributing pinball machines onto military bases. And it kind of moved from there to them starting to make some of their own mechanical games and you know, games involving a video screen. The first, you know, they were one of the early makers of coin-operated uh, video games. And, and then he had sold that company, believe it or not, he'd sold it to uh, uh, a company involved in the nuclear. Uh, and that, that was a conglomerate that was acquiring a whole bunch of things. And they kind of ran it very poorly for a period of time. And then they sold it to uh, uh, a consortium that funded Nakayama-san the, the, who had been the leading uh, Japanese distributor of Sega games at that time. Uh, we, we, uh, in the industry, we called him Nak, and he was uh, quite an iconic uh, figure uh, in Japan and in the game industry as all of this was uh, happening. And, and he ended up running the company, and uh, you know he was the president of Sega uh, pretty much through their entire kind of glory years, and yeah. he had quite a reputation for being very uh, egocentric and bombastic and, and having various eccentricities. So I'm sure you've uh, heard about him. 
Well, but anyway, I called David Rosen first, who he, and he had he had come back to Sega to serve as the the kind of the uh, chairman of the company and in a figurehead in America. And the first thing that he said to me on the phone was that they were going to huff and puff and blow my house down. He was saying, "I can't believe that you're running a public company and you don't understand that we're going to blow you out of the water and it's going to trash your stock price. And you're going to have sure lawsuits and you're really just going to need to bend." your knee and kiss the ring and basically threatening me. And I'm just saying, well, you know, uh, whatever, but uh, maybe we should get together, have a meeting and talk. And so he agreed to that. So I, I went over to Sega and, you know, they had their offices at that time in South San Francisco and, and, you know, guys like Mike Katz were there and David Rosen was there. And we, we started that conversation again, that was uh, in early May. And it uh, began to become clear to me that there was a possibility of working something out. And we, we worked on it in May before we all went to Chicago. And in fact, it was actually pretty far along uh, later in the month of May. And there was one stumbling block where, uh, you know, they wanted to get a $2 fee per unit of software. And I wanted to put a cap on it at a million units. And everybody on my management team said, hey, Tripp, you've done a great job. This is amazing. This is incredible. Uh, just don't ask for that. We'll get this deal done. We'll have a great CES announcing this partnership. And I basically disagree with my entire executive team. And I said, look, I, I know we're doing the right thing. We don't even have to have this agreement. I'd rather get this really save us a lot of money. I think they'll agree to it. And even if they don't agree with it, I'd rather just go to CES, announce our games without them, let them file a lawsuit, start that lawsuit, go, go into the discovery process and have them start to develop some conviction that we're gonna fight it out. And at that point, if they haven't already given me what I'm asking for, they'll give it to me then. And of course, I'm just getting this collective eye roll. Everybody in the room is like <laughs> frustrated, like, oh my God. But uh, honestly, that was my company. That was my baby. And everybody knew it. And you know, they're, they're not like uh, going to the board of directors saying, hey, you really have to fire Trip and replace him. They're just saying, okay, this is what, <laughs> Trip, wants, this is what Trip wants to do. So this is what we're going to do. And I got Sega to agree to it. And I was kind of shocked because I got them to agree a week before we even went to CES. So what happened at CES was I got to get, I sat down for an entire day in, in the evening with Jamie Cook, who was the lawyer that uh, was basically the general counsel for Sega of America. And, you know, we had documents and we were hammering out all the little uh, details, trying to get that thing done so that we could sign it before the show opened in the morning. And we actually pulled that off. So what did you end up accomplishing later on with the Joe Montana game and th in that agreement? Yeah, so we, uh, we, we, we got the Sega business off and running and we were ready to uh, ship products already, in fact. Uh, but we even back in March and April, our sales leaders had been starting to talk to our biggest retailers. And by April, we were taking orders from all of our retail customers for our first games, which we're going to ship in June. And we're talking about games like Populous and Budokan and various others. And we had other games in development that were pretty far along that were ready to uh, come to market in the fall, like Madden Football. So we're, uh, uh, we have a great CES. Uh, the, the products take off. Everything's going really well. There's just incredible momentum every single month after that. And we get out to around uh, September in late August, I can't remember when. But uh, this is where uh, Sega began to panic because they had a game in development called Joe Montana Football and they began right. to realize that it was gonna miss Christmas. So basically, I was essentially told by Nakayama-san that he thought that cancel Madden, the release of Madden and turn that game into Joe Montana Football and do it for the good of the platform because we were both so dependent on this Sega Genesis platform doing well. And they had obviously uh, hired Joe Montana to be kind of the spokesman for the entire product line. So he was really the television pitch man 
for the Sega Genesis. And they also had the rights to therefore uh, release a uh, football game with his name on it. But uh, they, they, they couldn't get the development done. And I had some executives at EA thought, hey, this is a great idea. And I go, are you kidding? This is a terrible idea. Uh, we're about to crush it with Madden football. And this is a key flagship in us building a fantastic sports game business on the Genesis as well as elsewhere. This is the right platform for us to really finally build a, a great sports business. And we, uh, we had other things already teed up that were part of that process. And so I, I, I had the idea that uh, I don't want to disappoint Sega, so we'll just do both. So I went back to Sega and I said, look, uh, give us $2 million in cash and in six weeks, we'll give you Joe Montana football, but we're gonna go ahead and release Madden football. And we have to all agree that this is good because under the hood, the code base of Montana football was 98% identical to the code base of Madden. But what I did in the design, I, can, I personally designed the Montana game to make sure it was not gonna really compete with what we were doing with the Madden game. So this involved tilting the camera angle so that you had a top down, tap down, top down kind of 2D view yeah. instead of the uh, fake 3D view that we'd achieved with the uh, angled field. And we were scaling the size of the players as they moved up and down the field to kind of create a 3D illusion. And we gave them basically fixed size, big head players. Uh, those were kind of a popular thing in Japan. And, and then I stripped the playbook down. I had actually personally built the playbook and it had like 125 plays in it on the Sega Genesis for Madden. And we stripped it down to like 13 plays and added a few little flourishes involving uh, Montana's personality, you know, to, to flash a few uh, gifts of uh, him celebrating a touchdown and that kind of thing. So we, we personalized it to make it feel like, oh, okay, this is the Joe Montana game. And you can get to feel like you're uh, Joe Montana. And we got that done in six weeks. And both games shipped in time for Christmas. And they were two selling Genesis games at Christmas. And nobody knew they were pretty much the same game. Yeah. Uh, and in console wars, you know, they talk about that too, how they feel lucky that they got away with the public never catching on. Yep. All right. Um, Sean, you had a question about Origin. Yeah, I want to I want to back up to Origin for just a minute, and then we're gonna we're gonna move on from EA. Origin's kind of interesting because it seems like there is a lot of animosity towards EA from uh, Lord British, and I want to know if you can talk a little bit about how you became involved with distributing Origin games and the fallout between your company and Origin that resulted in the lawsuit, and in your perspective on that. Yeah, uh, I have a lot of respect for the uh, talent. Uh, that uh, that uh, Richard Garriott has, and of course uh, Ultima, that was his. Uh, in my opinion, still, you know, he, he's had, he had a heck of a great career, and I still think of Ultima as being the thing that he did. Uh, around the time that uh, I got to know Ultima, they uh, had built out some other brands, and they were trying to become a, a broader-based uh, publisher, and uh, we started having these conversations, and some of those conversations back when he was uh, a key executive there. And then, of course, I, I met uh, Richard's uh, brother and, and, and had known Richard for a while because uh, I had actually uh, tried to convince Richard back in, in uh, 1982 to, to let EA be his publisher. And he, he chose not to do that and you know, did, did very well on his own and then brought his brother in to kind of help him run the company. At any rate, uh, they, uh, uh, they were more responsive to this idea that we could help them more safely grow themselves as a publisher by taking over the distribution function. And it was going to allow us to you know, write them a big order that would pay for a lot of inventory that would kind of you know, get their cash flow cooking along so they wouldn't have to raise money. And you know, really, that relationship was, uh, was a win-win, but it had a, it had a term. I mean, a, a period of time where it was uh, an exclusive uh, deal. And as it got to the end of that term, they wanted out of the deal. And by that time, I'd hired a guy named uh, Randy Thier to run uh, that part of our business. It was a, a business unit that I created 
and, and call the affiliated labels business. And they were basically these distribution deals. And so he had been managing that relationship for over a year. And the story I got from Randy was that they wanted to violate the agreement. And what I told Randy was, well, you know, with this agreement is important to us and we, we want to fully uh, protect our rights in the agreement. And this ended up boiling down to the uh, release of Ultima 4, or maybe it was 5. I'm trying to remember which one. It probably was 4. But at any rate, uh, they, um, they were, they, what they wanted to do was break with us and the agreement and be the only company supplying this new version of Ultima. And it was happening well within our contract period. And therefore, uh, I wanted us to be able to uh, release the game because it was part of our uh, agreement. And that, that was really the, the dispute. Uh, what I think really alienated uh, the Garriott brothers was the way that Randy ended up communicating our desire to be firm about enforcing the contract revisions. And for whatever reason, uh, they in particular decided to blame me, you know, for being the, the uh, uh, hard ass, uh, you know, presumably uh, Randy uh, decided to be a messenger and say, Trip wants that. I really actually wasn't that closely involved. But uh, one of the things I can say about uh, uh, the Garriotts is that they're really good at holding a grudge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sure, you know, I've, I've certainly pissed off plenty of people over the course of my career. But, you know, there's only a few of them where I thought they were like really unethical people that were way off base. That happens occasionally. And then there, there's a few times where, you know, you have a legitimate misunderstanding and you can tell that, okay, uh, both sides maybe contributed to that misunderstanding. And, you know, I, I uh, was willing to kind of work it out and make peace with it. We, we reached a, an agreement, but one of the things you probably know about negotiations is that when parties compromise, nobody's really thrilled. And that's, that's what happened. And, you know, we accepted it and honestly, uh, they weren't maybe as uh, mature about accepting it. I don't want to necessarily beat the topic to death, but one of the allegations from them was that EA felt like they were holding back Ultima because part of the agreement was that there had to be a purchase of $9.3 million in software per calendar year from, from whatever the set date was. And that they were about a month removed from the calendar end of a year, and they'd only purchased $6.6 .6 million. And Origin really hadn't been releasing software. So EA felt that, maybe they were holding this back to try to get out of the agreement. And then to keep that agreement active, they went ahead and ordered the amount to fill that gap to 9.3. And Origin refused to fulfill that order out of fear that you guys would return the software. Um, I, I guess nobody really knows what the end result of that would have been, but it, was that something that you were connected to or disconnected from? And are you familiar with any of this conversation that was going on behind the scenes? Honestly, this is the first time in my life that I've heard the numbers you just used. <laughs> and I'll, here's, what I'll, here's what I'll tell you is that the direction that I would have given, because by that time, you know, Larry Prost was running Electronic Arts Distribution and Randy had been shifted over from reporting to me to reporting to Larry. So they were the guys dealing with the uh, direct interaction uh, with Origin. And shoot, uh, you know, I, I don't know about a uh, contract or, uh, you know, th there was a little bit of a uh, game of chicken. This, this is what I do remember is we all know this new Ultimate Game's coming and we, we want to be able to sell it. We feel like it's in our contractual rights to sell it. And we absolutely would have wanted to place a big order for it, sold the heck out of those games. I mean, there, I guarantee you, there's no way there's no way that we ever would have bought a bunch of inventory and then purposely had a plan to buy it and then return it later. That, <laughs> that never would have happened. You know what? Sometimes we would buy too much inventory and we wouldn't be able to sell it and we'd be upset about it and we'd want to, want to get some accommodation and, mm -hmm. and, that, and that could make people upset. But for the most part, when you buy inventory, it's much simpler for you to, to find a place to sell it, even if you have to discount it. And it, it's been a standard practice for EA throughout its entire history to be willing to give discounts to retailers to help inventory move through. It doesn't really help anybody if you have to pull products out of channels 
and send them back to the originator, that's just bad for everybody. Well, I guess to keep things moving on, let's uh, segue away from EA into, into 3DO. What actually kept you from accomplishing your goals at EA and required you to found 3DO? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, by the time you get to 1990, I've been on a pretty good run where a whole lot of good things had happened for more than 15 years, pretty much continuously. I was on a really streak. And what I saw as the biggest future problem at that time for EA was that uh, everybody in the industry had seen what we had done with the Sega Genesis. And every hardware company was gonna try to figure out how to make sure that could never ever happen again. And this equipment would have a four or five year productive life. And then we'd have to be moving on to new machines. And I had been doing a survey of all of the hardware companies around the world uh, in 1989 and 1990 and trying to figure out what are their plans for things like graphic processors and optical disc media and networking and sound chips and digital sound and voice. And just, you know, is anybody going to make a really great audiovisual machine that will allow us to make the kind of games that, that are really going to be fabulous and that would allow the industry to kind of move forward and be a, a much bigger industry. And nobody was really doing anything very interesting around that time. And it was extremely frustrating. PC had become pretty much a, you know, Microsoft Windows desktop worker product. And the computer market was kind of dead. And then the console market was focused on the Nintendo was extremely risky and capital intensive. And that's why not a lot of companies that have ever focused on making cartridge console games actually survived and, and made a lot of money over a long period of time. So it, it was just a, a rock in a hard place. And I started looking ahead thinking, well, shoot, we're a big successful company now. We've got a lot of connections. We know all these people. And why couldn't we get more actively involved in hardware the way Microsoft is, the way Sega is, the way Nintendo is, et cetera? And of course, at that time, nobody knew that Sony was going to be making the PlayStation. And I went around and talked to big manufacturers, including Matsushita and Sony. And everybody, including Sony, was very interested in the 3D idea. Yeah. And Sony actually almost came on board because they weren't that far along in the PlayStation yet. But okay, you know, so Ken Kutaragi, Ken Kutaragi was a real genius. Pretty good at convincing Sony to just stick with what he wanted to do. And even then, I still didn't know it. I didn't find out about it for a while. I think if I'd known about the PlayStation, there wouldn't have been a reason to have to do 3DO. But by doing 3D, I would actually help EA have a much stronger bargaining power than Sony. So that that was, uh, in some ways, 3D's lasting legacy. Well, I imagine, I imagine more than just EA, because, you know, Crystal Dynamics made a huge support for the 3DO interactive multiplayer. And lots of those got sequels or ports to other systems. So I'd imagine 3DO kind of served as that stepping stone to the next generation for several companies. Yeah, that's right. In fact... Uh, it introduced a lot of uh, a lot of the right features, both in terms of the product and also in the licensing program. At one point, Phil Harrison, around the launch of the PlayStation, told me that they had shamelessly copied a whole bunch of stuff from our licensing program and put it into the binder for the <laughs> Sony developers. And you know, I mean, I, I uh, thought that was a sign of respect. But uh, you know, in the end. I, I really can't look at 3DO any other way than to recognize that it was too ambitious and it was such a big deal to do something like that, that I shouldn't have really been surprised that that the management team and the board at EA would be uncomfortable about it staying inside EA, that, you know, that they would look for the first opportunity to get it to be its own separate company. And th that was a flawed... Uh, because it didn't have enough juice to make it as a separate company on its own. And as you guys know, if you're going to make a console, you're going to have to have some killer apps, and you really have to count on first-party publishing to have them. And when you know when the 3DO project started for its first year, it was something just inside EA. 
And once it became a separate thing and it had stock that had value and, uh, and EA was independent from it, then it became possible for EA to say, well, hey, we're going to make games for 3D, but we'll move them over to the PlayStation and we're going to tell Sony that they have to give us a special deal if they expect us to stab 3DO in the back. And, and then, hey, look, at this is great. We have all the stock in 3DO. Let's sell it. So once the strategic partners sold their equity interest in 3DO, they didn't really care what happened to 3DO. And the strategic partners, so you would have Panasonic, you would have EA. Yeah, there was, you know, think about it. There was uh, uh, MCA AT &T. Universal. There was Warner Brothers, you know, Time Warner and, and various others. I, I, I thought that, hey, why can't we make this work like Dolby Labs? You know, Dolby Labs, you know, Dolby Sound, that's an example of a successful technology licensing company, but their model is more of a stealth model. They don't, they don't really, to get their stuff to work, they don't need to have expensive upfront commitments. They don't need to introduce products that, are, that have to come down in cost from manufacturing volume. They don't have to have a, an expensive licensing program and yet, and you know, they're they're more agile you know, in the way they're able to do things. In the console market, there's a big front end cost to establish a new console. Somebody has to fund that, and you know, usually the uh, hardware it may seem expensive at first, but the manufacturer is is probably losing money. Right. The the other thing that really helped the PlayStation take off, I I, I wouldn't in any way want to criticize what Sony did because their strategy with the PlayStation was very comprehensive and very professional in many dimensions where others had failed. But they did get a little bit of wind at their back because after they made the incredibly courageous decision to be aggressive with their pricing and launch it in the United States at a 299 price point, which just, you know, in that room at E3 when they announced that in 1995, there was a collective gasp. And that's when Howard Lincoln of Nintendo said, well, I hope your shareholders like that. He just thought it was stupid. It, Oh, you're going to destroy your, your your company stock price with that idiocy because you have to lose a lot of money. Only a few months after that, the price of RAM plummeted. You know, so we, we were in a phase where uh, you know random access memory was extremely expensive because the PC market was eating up all the RAM, and PC you can afford to pay more for it. So the, the guys selling PCs they're bidding higher and higher prices to get the limited RAM manufacturing capacity. And it takes a while for new, new fab facilities to come online to add more capacity that would bring prices down. And uh, Sony caught that wave. Uh, you know, by, the, by January, after their launch in the US, the price of a megabyte of RAM, it, in one day, it went from like maybe $20 down to $8. It was something like that. And there were three megabytes of RAM in the, in the PlayStation. So that that recouped right there. They that recouped their loss uh, on on that 299 uh, price point, and they also were manufacturing CD-ROM drives, and they knew that the manufacturing of those was expanding so fast that they could bet on uh, those prices coming down, those costs coming down. So that Sony had a swagger, and they really played that out. And I remember uh, chatting with Howard Lincoln a couple of years later, and we were just driving in a car together in Seattle on our way to lunch. And he just said to me, you know, Tripp, it was no big deal for Nintendo dealing with companies like Sega, but Sony, that was just a whole different deal. I mean, because their brand power was so huge and they're, they were such a machine. So, you know, honestly, again, I think if, uh, if I'd known back in 1990, I'd come with that product, yeah. I wouldn't have done 3D. Okay, well, back to... Back to 3D, because I think there's I think there's still really a lot of nice things in the system. It has a lot of has a lot of great games, and I think it has an important place in history. Um, you mentioned that you were very close to with, with Sony for them to release 3DO, and you didn't know that they were working on PlayStation. And I spoke with Tom Kalinsky, who said, you know, he had you in in Tokyo at high level meetings for Sega to release a 3DO console, and I think that was the first time that came public. And we know that there were other, you know, announced ones like the AT&T one. So who else was pretty close to getting on board with you that you never got to get off the ground with? Well, there were two generations of 3DO hardware, and the first one came to market, and the primary supplier was Matsusha using the Panasonic brand, and then we had other products from Sanyo 
and uh, other licensees, including uh, LG, Samsung. Gold Star, yeah. Uh, uh, also, uh, Creative Labs did a, uh, a board for the PC. 3DO Blaster. Yeah. So there were eight hardware licensees, and the heavy lifting there was done by Matsusha, and they priced the product too high. I mean, a lot of people talk about the 99 price, but hardly anybody ever actually sold one at that price. Oh, I'm sure. There was a suggested list price for Panasonic, and when it launched in October, I'm sorry, September of 93, the street price was really five ninety nine, and it came down to four ninety nine in February, I think. But even that was a little bit too high, and and then obviously uh, later on Sony's coming out at two ninety nine, and it was just uh, the race was on, and and Panasonic couldn't make money on the hardware, and so they they couldn't be that aggressive, and then the smaller manufacturers never really made a big effort either. So as we began to learn more about the PlayStation, we thought, well, shoot, uh, what, maybe what we need to do is leapfrog it and go to a 64-bit architecture. So the M2 project. That was the M2. And we did actually build that out. We got it, uh, we got it to work, but it was, it was kind of too little too late. But we did have some really uh, fascinating conversations with Sega, uh, Toshiba, the Korean companies, uh, you know, there, there was plenty of interest in it, and there was a, an align, a, a alliance that was put together for a period of time that included Matsusha, Sega, and Philips, and the two leading manufacturers, Samsung and LG, you know, Goldstar. And uh, that could have been interesting, but uh, the, the, the way Sony does it, as one company where they're going to make a high profit on software and they're going to make a high profit on third party software licensing fees. And they're running their own fab to make the chips and they're you know, manufacturing their own disk drives. And, you know, they've got a whole integrated thing. And, you know, Sony had bet two billion dollars on that business. You know, and, you know, compared to that, 3DO raised a grand total of one hundred and fifty million. Yeah. And Panasonic, uh, you know, couldn't really. You know, devote. Uh, they just couldn't pull the trigger to really commit to be a major competitor with uh, with Sony, and they probably would have had to acquire 3D to really even make that even make that work. So it was just a, a challenging situation. But uh, I had that alliance uh, with uh, M2 and managed to convince those companies to kick million dollars to fund the development of the technology because by that time I realized that yeah, 3D was not going to really make money on license fees. We're going to have to be a technology company that gets companies to fund our development. Right. And uh, everybody agreed to that principle, but we didn't have a written contract yet. And then Phillips decided to pull out because they had a bunch of other corporate issues. And then the CEO of Matsusha decided that he wanted to have dinner with Nakayama-san. And that went very badly. You know, these are two guys from the opposite side of the railroad tracks in Japan and with uh, very different cultural views. And Masushi is a very traditional, proud company. And they told us after this dinner had happened that uh, they had decided to kick Sega out of the alliance. Huh. Had this happened, would the Saturn have not come out? Is that kind of the general thought there? No, this is actually after... Uh, this is after Saturn, or it's in the middle of Saturn. Saturn's already a thing, and it's already uh, at some uh, point along its trajectory. Yeah, this is this. So this is like we're talking like '93 right now, right? Well, actually, this, these conversations are going on more like '95. Okay, so this is way after Saturn. And and this is to make a product that would come out a few years later that would be a generation beyond products like Saturn and PlayStation. Right. This is for the M2. Yeah. So. So Sega actually really was interested, and then uh, Masushi said, "No, they can't do the deal." And then Masushi said to me, "Yeah, and by the way, with uh, with fewer partners now, and, and us kind of leading this deal, uh, we want you to just make the deal with us, and you're only going to get 50 million." And I said, "Well, look, that just doesn't even work. Uh, it's going to cost us more than that to just do the engineering, and it wouldn't necessarily allow the company to survive." And you know, we agreed on 100 million. You know, if you want to rearrange the members of the alliance and you want to control it, that's up to you. But the cost is still 100 million. 
And they said, uh, well, we don't think so, but you know, come over to Japan and we'll talk about it. So I, I'm, I'm in Osaka at Matsushita headquarters and they're kind of digging in their heels about this idea that it's gonna be 50 million. And I said to them, well, you know, I've got uh, other alternative ways of bringing this to market. And they said, well, uh, those don't include Samsung and LG Goldstar because they basically authorized, authorized us to negotiate on their behalf. And so you, we're the only guys you can talk to and uh, we're, we're going to make a deal. We told them we'd make a deal with them later to include them, which meant, okay, the Koreans are screwed. They just don't know it yet. And they've, they've uh, set it up where now Matsusha feels like they're controlling the negotiations. I don't have any other alternatives. So I then uh, told my staff to uh, get me a ticket to, from Osaka to Seoul, and get me a taxi to the airport. And of course, they had to then go out and tell an admin person at Matsushita to make those arrangements. So they then brought a note back into the room, to make sure that the uh, senior executives in the room knew that I was about to go to Korea. So I get in the cab and I, I end the meeting and I leave and I fly to Korea. Meanwhile, Matsusha, their executives then call up Samsung and LG Goldstar and said, what the heck is going on? You agreed not to talk to Hawkinson but he's coming to Korea. What are you doing? Well, we don't have any appointments with him. We're not meeting with him. Well, what the hell is he coming to Korea for? We don't know. Well, go find out. Anyway, I get to Korea. I don't have an agenda. I don't have any meeting scheduled with anyone. I just checked into a hotel. I sat there for two days. I went back home to San Francisco. And then I kept insisting that I needed $100 million if they wanted to get the technology. And that if I didn't get it, I was going to bring it to market with another partner. And I found out late after I got all hundred million, after they agreed, I found out later that they had the Koreans running around trying to figure out what hotel I was in, what <laughs> trade group that hotel was associated with, what hardware companies that might mean I'm talking to. And they told me they had concluded that I was talking to Hyundai. I knew <laughs> but I got all hundred million. And, but again, it's a little bit tragic because all they, they never did was prolong, it just prolonged the agony. I mean, 3DO had a very long death. You know, it took yeah. 12 years for that company to die mercifully. What was the M1 and M2 designation in reference to? I don't recall uh, using M1. I mean, uh, the um, original 3DO player, we just called it the 3DO. And I, I think there were probably some other uh, names uh, that were used. Uh, it was when we wanted to do a second generation. We thought we need a name that sounds like a. So it's not the first machine; it's the second machine. Okay, how about calling it M two? Machine two, mystery solved. Would that have been on the official packaging? Was that the intention, or did you have any other ideas in mind for a name for the system when it launched? You know, I think that was that was going to be the designated name of the technology, and of course, any manufacturer could have branded the product. In the, in the way that, say, Matsushita called the 3DO player the real. Yeah. 3DO interactive, real 3DO interactive multiplayer. Yeah, so so a couple of things came out with M2 stuff. Like some there were some kiosk and like car things, and then some Konami arcade games used M2 hardware. So I want to go back though. So I was going back. I know I know that Sega had a potential deal with M for M2 around in, in the mid 90s. But Tom Kalinsky talks about a time shortly after he became CEO of Sega around 92 or so that Sega was in talks to release the first 3DO interactive multiplayer. Do you recall anything going on there? I don't think they were very interested at that point. I mean, you know, look, um, if, you know, you, you keep your friends close and your enemies closer, obviously in the early 90s, they want to know as much as possible about what we might be doing. That makes sense. Yeah, I can, I, I, especially... Having talked to them, I can totally see those guys going, hey, let's pretend we're interested. Check out yeah, this. Yeah, honestly, uh, I, I wasn't really courting them, and we weren't really telling them all that that much because you know, we were pretty sure that they were the competition. How hard was it for you to uh, – so when you founded 3DO in 91, you stepped down as CEO of EA, but you stayed uh, chair of the board, correct? Yeah, what happened is that I couldn't be – I could not be CEO of both companies because they were doing business together and I was advised legally. 
uh, not just that we were doing business together, but there were areas in where, where we had to compete with each other because it was clear that 3DO, in order to have first party software with EA moving games like Road Rash and Madden over to the PlayStation, we were gonna have to do some other games that would be able to distinguish the 3DO platform. And, and that's when I uh, got advice that I, I, I shouldn't be, uh, uh, in fact, chairman of both companies either. So, so, so first it was, okay, I'm only, I, I'm only, I can only, be, I'm only gonna be CEO of one of these companies for practical reasons. And, you know, but it, it seemed like a stable relationship because I was the largest shareholder of EA and EA was the largest shareholder of 3DO and I thought that kept us connected. But the reality is that once 3DO was spun out as a separate company, the companies had different destinies, different goals, different risks they had to manage and were starting to separate, migrate further and further apart as, as time went on. And then once the PlayStation was announced, it became clear that it was more problematic. So I stepped down as the chairman of EA in 1994. How, how hard was it for you to do that? And how connected are you to EA today? And what's it like to watch EA grow into what it's become from what, from report, the, point, the point that you founded it to where it is today in 2018? Well, you know, uh, I, I spent 11 years planning and preparing to start EA, and I spent 12 years leading it. That's a long time. It's a, it's yeah. a long relationship. And really, it was, it was literally, for me, like my first child. And by, you know, I have four real children, but I, uh, <laughs> I had EA first, you know, and I had EA for uh, more than a decade before I had actual children. So it really it was absolutely something that I feel like I gave birth to, and it really means a heck of a lot to me. And I am proud of that company for having survived. I mean, it's, you know, it's been difficult for, uh, for very many companies to, uh, to do that and have the, the kind of level of success EA's had. There's really, in America, only about one company per year that ends up being a, a ground up startup that gets to that level of success. I mean, it's kind of shocking. Yeah. So the odds of the company having it turn out that way are probably about one in, in 20 million. I mean, it's really sure. against the odds. So I'm, I'm pretty thrilled that the company has lasted and done as well uh, as it has. And, and yet in the 1990s, it was like a rebellious teenager. Yeah. And, oh yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, it, uh, it, it brought about a, a separation uh, because of, I think, uh, you can maybe just call it uh, conflicting ego interests. And, you know, they, uh, d they, did, they didn't get perfectly resolved at that time. And, you know, it, it was bittersweet. And, you know, I have, I have some reg regret about it. And uh, at the same time, I have a tremendous amount of uh, uh, satisfaction in having given birth to that company and shaping it uh, as much as I did for as long as I did and having, having it continue to uh, uh, do many of the things that, uh, that were working that they stuck with. I mean, I'm particularly proud of having created the Madden brand and started that relation with John and having that uh, desire for sports simulation games to be authentic. And that's really what ultimately came to define the EA Sports brand that is uh, alive. So those are the things that I'm really satisfied about and really, really pleased about. But obviously I would have had a uh, pretty interesting life and in some ways a less stressful life if I just stayed at EA and stayed <laughs> with the mothership. Okay, so um, now let's talk about what you've done since the 3DO days. And give us a little brief overview of what you've done, what you're up to now. And then, you know, you'll only be, I think, uh, 65 this year. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, so you're yeah, pretty right. young compared to, like, being basically one of the founding fathers of gaming. You're 10 to, 5, 10 to 20 years younger than pretty much most of the people that we would see as your peers. What do you got next after? Well, you know, I, I feel like uh, a transformation – it, it got planted in me like a seed about 20 years ago, because 20 years ago is when I'm, I'm starting to uh, fail. You know, after, after a lot of years of success after success and 
working my way through issues and overcoming obstacles and setbacks and figuring out uh, how to make things work. In fact, uh, there was a, like an industry meme around that time, don't bet against Trev. <laughs> it was just uh, something a lot of people in the industry said because they, they saw me uh, so effectively. And honestly, I was getting kind of cocky. I think, you know, when, when you uh, have too much success, you're less likely to be aware of your blind spots. You're more likely to go far uh, with your ambition and how, how much you're pushing the envelope. And I started to do that and it bit me and it bit me pretty hard. And, you know, I, I don't think my ego liked it very much. And so for a while I was determined to prove that I still had, I still had the mojo. And again, that's kind of misguided. I, I'm at a point in my life now where I can look at ego and recognize that it's just pretty much completely useless. All, all your ego is trying to do is lie to you to make you feel better about uh, your deepest wounds. And you're just much better off shutting that down and tuning into who you really are and trying to figure out how to heal those wounds and forgive as needed and accept as needed and develop the kind of tools and practices that allow you to be happy under any set of circumstances instead of having a pride reaction or an ego reaction or a selfish reaction. Anyway, I started doing that work over 20 years ago, and that was around the same time that Meridian 59 came out. And that was, you know, MMO with graphics. So these last 20 or so years have been about me transforming myself as a person while in parallel being almost entirely focused on uh, digital games, you know, starting with internet games like Marine 59, some of the work I did that got patented around that virtual goods economies and pioneering ideas there. Some of that was inspired by what I saw in Magic the Gathering, the first collectible trading card game that came out in 1994. And, and uh, I got into mobile then with Digital Chocolate in 2003 and Anyway, uh, a lot of interesting things happen after that on the digital side. You know, the casual games, social games, mobile games, free-to-play games, virtual goods economies. And it, it's been a really fascinating period. And I, I didn't have uh, great commercial success. Uh, did a lot of innovative things, uh, won a lot of awards. Uh, I think uh, broke a lot of new ground, did a lot of interesting pioneering. And, you know, look, uh, the reason that we all do this, I think, is because we love it. Yeah. And I'm more committed to play than any other activity in human existence. And I, I love the fact that we figured out all these clever ways to play with these technologies and have a richer, deeper experience and to learn things. And I, I just love being involved in it. And it's kind of silly to avoid risk and not innovate because you're afraid of failure. You've got to be willing to be courageous and vulnerable. And I've been able to do that in both my work and in my personal life uh, as a result. I'm having more fun than ever before. And uh, among other things that I do today, I work with a bunch of tech companies advising their founders and CEOs. And I've really helped those companies a lot. And so I'm really pleased about that. I'd like to help these guys not hit every single pothole <laughs> and speed bump that I hit. And I'm a professor of practice uh, teaching entrepreneurship and leadership at the uh, technology management program at the University of California in Santa Barbara. I have a nonprofit foundation. I work with social entrepreneurs and uh, I work around causes that include homelessness here in Santa Barbara. I mentor recovering addicts at a uh, rescue center. Anyway, I've got a very fulfilling life. I've got four kids that uh, honestly are the uh, greatest source of fulfillment I've ever had in my life. And there's every day is a joy to be their father. And uh, I'm pretty busy. <laughs> it sounds like it. It sounds like it. Um so when you're 75, what do you see yourself doing 10 years from now? I just really hope I can make it that far. Oh, if, I you look, that far if I get that far, then I'll be saying, yeah, let's let's get to 85. You don't look at you over 55 to me, just so you know. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm really curious. With, so with all, all of your experience going forward and having ran multiple companies and success, either in yourself or financially, was there anything you could have done with 3DO and either of the two systems that would have actually saved the company? You know, I, th I think the problem would have been a lack of enough capital. So I think anybody that around that time would have been prepared to be a head-to-head -head competitor to Sony's 
which required you to put $2 billion in the pot. I think any company that, that had deep pockets and was willing to spend that kind of money could have been a really formidable competitor to Sony. But uh, really, uh, no, nobody really was able to step up and compete effectively with Sony because Sony made the biggest commitment and they had a great strategy, they had great leaders, and they had great technical execution. Okay, Trip. I know that um, we are probably long on time. I just want to make. I just want to get your gauge on it. Yeah, it'd be good to wrap things up. Okay. Well, I think I have everything asked that I I came wanting to ask more than anything. Zach, do you have any follow up last question? What's the favorite game uh, that you were ever involved with at EA? Well, I, I love working on the start of the sports thing, and it began with uh, an idea I had that became Dr. J and Larry Bird go one-on-one. -on -one. So I have a very soft spot for, <laughs> for that game, although uh, early EA products that, that are still kind of all-time favorites like Archon and Mule. And then, of course, Madden is uh, the one that I uh, maybe have the most enduring satisfaction because I was a football fanatic and played football and almost almost became a football coach myself. My best friend, who I played all the geeky games with, he actually did become a football coach. So I'm just re I was really into football. I still follow it, but I'm actually more of a baseball fan now. And, I, and, I'm, and by the way, I really enjoyed working on high baseball at 3DO. But... Uh, those are some of the ones that I can uh, just top of mind think about that I worked on. Uh, Road Rash, uh, I had maybe less to do with that, but that's one of my favorite uh, EA games also. And Meanwhile, that needs um, to come back, by the way. That's one. Of, that was one of my favorites too. I agree, I totally agree. But uh, I just also want to just do a shout out about some of my favorite games that I didn't have anything to do with. I Absolutely. started with Tetris. I still think Tetris is the most elegant game design ever. Have you seen the documentary on the world champions of Tetris? Yes, I have. It's hilarious. Oh, that is a wonderful movie. I'm going to, I can't remember the title of it. I'm going to have to edit it into this, but Trip Hawking approved. Yeah. And, you know, and I, and I loved um, uh, some of the 3DO games, like um, there was a little military game. Oh, man. I'm, I'm spacing out the name of it. Uh, what was that? Return Fire. Return Fire. Man, I yeah. love that game. And that game, got me down a direction that led to the invention of the Army Man brand, oh, which yeah. uh, it's funny, the Army Man brand, it sold 7 million units. It did over $300 million in, in, in revenue. Pretty darn successful brand. And yet uh, a lot of people criticize it because they couldn't handle the idea that we would use the same brand on different genres. And some of the games uh, maybe weren't as good as they could have been. But by and large, it was a huge success. And there's a lot of people that still finally remember that game. Sure. And that's an, that's an example where uh, I was able to help us integrate a strategy simulation alongside a good story with good characters and, and a sense of humor. And that's kind of my favorite kind of game. And uh, that's uh, one of the things I admire today about games like Fortnite. I feel like they're continuing in that direction by the of themselves and you know making fun of uh, some of the uh, more hardcore, serious history of first-person shooters and saying, oh yeah, what do you mean we can't have dance moves and emotes and, and do things that are just plain silly? I love that. Underground sharks, like Serious Sam. <laughs> um, yeah, I know, I just speaking of our 3DO strategy games, I just picked up Star Control 2, finally, for my 3DO. This is one of my favorite 3DO games. Yeah, that's a good game. Always has been. And it's got a great story, deep strategy, and I think the Shameless plug for these guys, but I know they're working on a, a third one right now. I think it's on Kickstarter. Oh, cool. Good for them. Do you still game today, Trip? I sure do. I, uh, I have a, my youngest kid is 14 and he and I are playing games all the time. I was just uh, uh, kibitzing him with him uh, uh, yesterday uh, playing uh, uh, Far Cry 5. And, uh, you know, he's a, he's a big Fortnite player and, there's a whole lot of stuff we, we do together. And uh, we also, we're just really big uh, board game and Magic the Gathering players. So cool. th 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 that's kind of our Jones. Uh, that's pretty rad. I have one question I'd like to ask to close this out, if that's okay with everybody else. Absolutely. And my question is, when you're gone from this earth, 
What do you want your legacy to be? Well, we haven't talked much about emotional intelligence, which is something that I didn't have when I was younger. Nobody ever taught me anything like that. And it was really painful going through what I went through and learning about it the hard way and then embracing it. So at least for me personally, the thing that I'm the most pleased about is the fact that I was able to develop practices and tools and skills that uh, make me just a way more effective human being and a much happier human being, again, kind of regardless of my circumstances. So that's the part of me that I'm the most pleased about. I don't think that's what other people might uh, might not notice or uh, think really matters. I'm certainly not a, a, a well-known pioneer in uh, emotional intelligence, although I've worked with those people and uh, have uh, learned a lot from them as my mentors. I think uh, I, I would say at this point, it's pretty clear that it was pretty useful that I was able to recognize that this is a creative medium that we all love and that it takes creative, innovative, artistic people that are you know, willing to try new ideas and boldly go where no one has gone before keep pushing that envelope. And that requires passion and, you know, belief and faith and, you know, w willingness to confront your fears. And every day in this industry, the best developers have to do that, you know, to make the next breakthrough. And I just uh, really have a huge amount of admiration for you know, a great big industry with so many people enjoying it and participating in it and moving on to the next level. And I'm very delighted that I uh, played a role in helping get it started. Absolutely. Well, Tripp, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to spend this basically almost two hours now with us. <laughs> My pleasure. We really appreciate you and ha have a blessed day and enjoy the time with your family. All right. Thanks. Take Cheers, care, sir. guys. Thanks. Take Cheers, care, sir. guys. Take care, guys.